reliable control devices, few moving parts, nothing to jam, easy to link. Wes, what are your comments? Uh, I would add that these devices are inherently fail-safe. A failure of the air supply will spring the return, will spring return the final control devices to their normal or fail-safe positions. Additionally, they are immune to electrical interference, whereas electric wires need shielding, conduit, or need to be otherwise segregated from line voltage. Airlines are not affected by outside interference. And finally, in cases where trade jurisdictions may overlap or conflict, an electrician would not necessarily be needed to run that conduit or to pull wires. Next slide. Okay, next, what we're going to talk about is output action. In any type of automatic control, we need to determine the controller action required. When using two-position control, the actions are pretty cut and dry. We would select a reverse acting control if we want the system to increase its output energized uh, out state on a decrease in temperature, humidity. We would select a direct acting control if we want the system to increase its output energized on an increase in temperature and humidity. In proportional control, things aren't quite so simple. We need to look not only at the action we want, but also what the safe position of the valve or damper should be. Pneumatic actions all ha have springs under their diaphragm. This means that the actuator will always go to a normal position on loss of air pressure. It's up to the person who engineered the job to make sure the actuators take the proper normal position and also work properly. Wes? In selecting thermostat, that is if the action is not known, typically we work backwards from the final control device fail position and whatever the application and the action needed. For example, in the chart up above on the right side, if we knew that a normally open valve was being used for heating, we would apply a direct acting thermostat. Therefore, as the temperature of the room increased, we would want the output pressure of the thermostat to increase and therefore close the valve. So in the case on the right-hand side, a direct acting thermostat and a heating application with a normally open valve would give us the result in action that uh, we desired. Next slide. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the fail-safe spring return positions. Because there is a spring in every pneumatic control device, the device will return to one end of its stroke upon system pressure loss. That position is termed the fail-safe position. It can either be normally open or normally closed, depending on the desired action. Shown here in this very simplified drawing is a heating valve whose fail-safe position is in the normally open position to the heating coil, and an outside air damper actuator whose fail-safe position is normally closed. Why in each case? The outdoor air damper should fail closed to protect the coil from freezing. The valve on the preheat coil should fail open. This will also protect the coil from freezing and will provide tempered air to the system. Two actuators used on the heating side of the system, yet each require a different safe action. Wes? I'd point out that the simplified diagram represented here does not illustrate a return air duct. So if you take the picture as shown at face value, the application wouldn't actually work very well because the valve with the 3 to 7 spring would be closed prior to the damper opening. In practice, you would have a normally open return air duct with its own actuator or somehow mechanically linked to the actuator uh, shown. The outdoor air damper uh, would move in tandem with the return air dam damper. They would work in tandem, but in opposite directions. Notice that this process takes place over a 10-pound span from 3 to 13 pounds. From the start point of the heating valve to the ending point of the damper actuator, in commercial pneumatics, we traditionally work with varied spring ranges between 3 and 13 pounds. But there are devices that work as low as 2 pounds and as high as 15 pounds. Next slide. Yeah, we're going to go on to room thermostats now. And the first one we'll talk about is the single pipe thermostat. 
Note there is only one piping connection to the thermostat, and a 0.007-inch orifice is installed in the main air supply feeding the thermostat and the control device. The restrictor is placed in the airline because the inlet air to the low-volume controller must be of a smaller volume than can be bled off by the controller's nozzle. If no restrictor were in the line, the control device would immediately go to full stroke and would be stuck there. Wes? Uh, two things about this uh, diagram regarding the restrictor as shown. The restrictor is represented by the circle with the X through it. The restrictor does not change the pressure in the airline. Think of it more like slowing the process down and allowing the thermostat to do its job. If this were a direct acting heating valve and the room were, let's say, overheated by sunlight or some other ambient conditions, the line on the right side of the restrictor would actually build up to a 20 pound pressure equal to the left side of the main air supply. The second thing about the restrictor is the .007 represents the diameter of the hole inside the restrictor where the air actually passes through. That's comparable to the width of a human hair. If you're being supplied with anything other than clean, dry air, the restrictor can be easily clogged. If you find that main air is not coming into the thermostat, the restrictor would be a good place to start troubleshooting at. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit more about how a single pipe action now works. This slide shows how a one-pipe thermostat operates. As the bimetal senses a temperature change is caused the flapper to move, thus increasing or decreasing the nozzle opening. If the nozzle is completely closed, the pressure in the branch line will increase until it is the same as the main pressure. If the nozzle is open far enough, air in excess of the amount coming through the restrictor is bled off, causing the pressure in the branch line to fall to zero. Thus, the thermostat may be thought of as a pressure regulator varying the pressure in the branch line in direct relationship to the temperature at the bimetal. One-pipe thermostats are very low-volume devices and should only be used with small actuators and valve. The branch line should never be very long. Thus, the control device should be no more than 20 to 30 feet from the thermostat. These thermostats have a dial set point and adjustable throttling range. Wes? Uh, and looking at this picture in more detail, you can see the arrow at the nozzle. And that's where the excess air is bled off from the thermostat. The hole in the nozzle needs to be larger than the hole in the restrictor. This will allow the branch air pressure to fall or go lower when necessary. The flapper would move away from the nozzle to allow the air to bleed. This happens as a result of the bimetal that's represented by the black and the blue uh, lines up at the top. It, so what happens is the bimetal is two dissimilar metals, which when changed in temperature cause a bending action. In a direct acting thermostat where the ambient condition is cold in the room or below the set point that the temperature uh, set point is at, the change would cause the bimetal to bend upwards moving the flapper away from the nozzle and causing the branch pressure to fall. This would cause the branch line pressure to the valve to go down. The normally open heating valve would open and it would allow more heat into the room. The air bleeding from that nozzle is the hissing sound that you hear when you manipulate the set point to its extremes. Next slide. 